Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah. Dear brothers and sisters, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to the Anfeed podcast. Uh, it's not every day that you get to meet or speak to somebody who's a real life hero. And I know he won't like me saying that, but uh, it's true, mashallah. My guest today is brother Mozambik. Mozambik is an author, he is an ex-Guantanamo prisoner, war on terror consultant and advocate for the rights of those held unjustly. He's also director of Outreach at CAGE. Assalamu alaikum, Brother Mozam. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and jazakallah khair for that introduction that I don't deserve um, and for having me on the Impaid uh, podcast. Jazakallah khair and Brother Mozam. Um, Brother, I was just um, thinking about Ramadan and for the last couple of, well, last Ramadan and this Ramadan will be very unusual for most people, right? Um, we're feeling a little bit disconnected from the mosques, uh, you know, especially women. I mean, even if some of the mosques are going to open, I think they might allow some brothers to, to come in, but sisters definitely won't. Um, so... I think in light of that, I thought you would be a great person to speak to because you experienced what could be described as like the most extreme version of uh, an alternative Ramadan, right? Um, and an alternative situation that any Muslim could kind of face where your normal rituals, the normal things that you do to connect with Allah, to connect with who you are, are kind of disrupted in such an extreme way. Um, so I, I haven't really heard many people talk to you about that. And so I really wanted to use this opportunity to, to speak to you about that and say, and, and ask you, you know, like, let, let me set the scene. <laughs> of course, you can set the scene better than me, but I'm just going to use my imagination. I was thinking to myself, subhanAllah, imagine if you were to be kidnapped, if you were to have something very extreme happen to you like that, at first you would go into kind of fight or flight mode, right? Your brain would just probably just be reacting on instinct. But at some point, your brain must reconnect with the fact that, you know, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can help you, or that it's the time for salah. You know, for a Muslim, you can never completely forget that, right? Can you please describe to us what it was like, you know, actually before you describe what it was like to first reconnect with that consciousness, can you describe to us what Ramadan was like before you experienced what you experienced? Because you're in Afghanistan, right? Well, uh, Bismillah yeah. alhamdulillah wa salatu wa uh, Ramadan prior to, to um, incarceration is, um, I guess it would be as normal as it is, is for most people. Um, the only difference is I would have said is I did spend Ramadan, some Ramadans in, in war zones uh, in, in Bosnia uh, and, and so forth prior to that. Um, but again, it's it's nothing to do with it's actually it's wherever it is. Mostly, it's uh, it's it's a time of uh, abstention, of course. But it's also you're looking forward to a time of joy and gathering, which uh, Ramadan is very much about. Especially um, on the one hand, yes, of course, you do have your time for seclusion, etikaf, with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. But at the same time, it's very communal in terms of um, opening your fast together, doing salat taraweeh together, and of course, culminating in the salat and the day of Eid. Uh, so it's very communal um, and so Eid and uh, Ramadan rather is something that uh, I spent in that way wherever I was even if it was in conflict zones and of course being incarcerated whether that was in Bagram, Kandahar, Guantanamo or even here in the UK in Belmarsh were completely different experiences. Hmm. So can you describe to us the f like the first time you became conscious of the fact that I don't know, that it was a Salah time or something, you know, like that. Uh, when you were kidnapped or when you when you did 
go through what you went through. Uh, yes, of course. And I've told this story a few times, but of course it, it is, it, it's a very powerful one and um, relating it often makes me emotional. Um, so I try mm -hmm. to tell it in the best way that I can. Um, I had been handed over by the Pakistani uh, intelligence to the Americans uh, at this obscure airport in, in Islamabad. And I couldn't see anything. I was completely hooded. Um, but when I was handed over to the Americans, I had thought at this point that we're going to get treated a little bit better and this will be the beginning of the end because the Americans are the quote unquote good guys. Uh, and I was wrong totally. What the Americans then did is um, me and, and the other prisoners who I couldn't see but felt, felt around me, they hooded me, they shackled my hands behind my back, they pushed me into the rukuk, the bailing position, and shackled my legs and then dragged me off with one soldier uh, and another soldier holding my arms down in almost a uh, as I said, a bowing position with my hands locked behind their arms. So it's excruciatingly painful. Um, and then they pushed me onto this C-130 transport plane, it's a military transport plane. You can hear the roar of the engines, um, the screams of the prisoners in pain, the screams of the soldiers shout shouting in all the different languages that they've learnt, swear words in Arabic and Urdu and Par Farsi and Pashto, trying to humiliate us. I could make out the flashes of the camera um, they were taking trophy pictures of us, despite the hood that I was wearing that's made of cloth. Um, and then the sounds of dogs barking and it, it's, it's, it's mayhem. And then they pushed me onto the floor. Uh, I wasn't put on a seat, it was the floor of this cargo aircraft, military cargo aircraft, and they strapped my legs. Um, and I sat there with my hands behind my back. And I sensed that there was somebody next to me, though I couldn't see him. And despite all of this noise, um, this brother, he speaks to me in Arabic, he says, I replied to him, and then he asked me where I'm from and so forth. And it was it seemed really bizarre that we're having this conversation, me next to this other brother. And he wasn't, he didn't sound like he's terrified the way that I felt like I was terrified. And he then said, I don't know Have you prayed Salat al Makhrib? Because I think the Salat time has, has come in. And I have to say that up until till this point, I was not thinking about Salah. I was not, that was not on my mind. At, at worst, I was thinking wherever I end up, prison cell or whatever it's going to be, I'll combine my prayers there. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will know that this is a, this is a, a darura, this is a necessity. But this brother, it's as if he was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to remind me in the Salah that the uh, prayer times have been prescribed upon believers at this specific times. And uh, I said to him, uh, I said, you're on the left, you lead the prayer. Now at this point, at this point, an American soldier had walked up towards us and he screamed and he said, if I hear you speaking again, he pulled out a knife and he put it to my neck. If I hear you speaking again, I'll slit your throat. And it is it almost, almost sounds funny because the next thing that happened, <laughs> there's a knife at my throat. And uh, uh, the brother, the living brother uh, says, Allahu Akbar. And uh, that's how the prayer began. My knife, my, the knife was taken away from my neck. And he began reciting the Quran, he began reciting the Fatiha and, and so forth. And we did Ruku'ah sujood in the way that we could bearing in mind the position we were in and, and uh, all of the actions of the salah with our hands behind our back so there was none of the things none of the actual things of the salah none of the arcana salah we could perform but none of the pillars of the prayer could we actually do no ruku mm. no sajda not even tashahud uh, not even uh, you know the, the finger nothing we could do nothing the only thing we could do is to sleep because we could turn our heads um and so I think to myself uh, that if anybody asks you, did the Americans ever let you pray? It's, it's, I almost laugh at that because how could they stop you? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <laughs> Those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala standing and sitting and even on their sides lying. There, there isn't, the only person that's going to stop you from praying is going to be you. SubhanAllah. And, and what was going through your mind during that prayer? 
Uh, multiple things. I tell you the first thing, and have you know, I'm being honest here. First thing is, what's wrong with this book? Why is he thinking about prayer at this time like this? That, that's the first thing that went in my mind. Mm. The second thing that went in my mind is that when the American soldiers putting a knife to my neck, I said, what better state could there be in to die in? Do not die except as in a state of Muslims and whatever, being a Muslim, and whatever, what better state is there than being in, in Salah? I didn't really think he was going to kill me. I didn't think he was going to do that for him, threatening me and trying to frighten me. Um, and then the third thing that came in my mind is that had this brother not been here, had this brother not said, that, have you prayed? I wouldn't have done that prayer. SubhanAllah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent you somebody as a reminder um, in the right time. And you know what's really the strange thing is, I don't know if I ever met this brother ever again. I, I, I went to oh, Libya after the, after the revolution. I went to Libya after the revolution. And I met a couple of former Guantanamo prisoners. And I've known several Libyan former Guantanamo prisoners. And I asked them, were you the one sitting next to me? Do you remember this incident? And none of them did. So I'm still trying to locate wow. who was it? Who was it? There's a couple of others that I've been talking to who were resettled to Senegal. And I've been trying to find out who was the man, but I've not been able to find him. Oh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward that brother. Um, wow, that's really, I, I have heard you tell that story before, but um, not in as much detail. So Jazakallah khairan for that. It's, it's really like, uh, I think it's, it's very symbolic. It's like probably the most symbolic aspect of the injustices that have been going on, you know, the fact that you can never stop, you can never stop a believer from connecting with Allah, no matter what state they're in, uh, you know, it really, it really highlights that in, in a very powerful way, even with a knife at their throat, right? Yeah, exactly. exactly. That, and that is, uh, for me, as I said, sometimes when I think of the story, I'm trying to tell it without getting emotional. But I try to remember that because there are times, of course, in our lives, even today, that we get weak in our prayers, we get weak in our iman, weak in our khushu, and all of those things. And I, and this, for me, is a source of reminding myself, look, Ma'azam, you're telling people about this, so don't get weak yourself. You're, you're reminding people about this, so remind yourself about this, of how you were, and it helps to pick me up. Jazakallah, Karen. Um, Brother Ma'azam, um... Uh, although you, you tend to downplay this, you're quite a knowledgeable person. Like it struck me that you're a student of knowledge even before this experience that happened to you, because you know you know Arabic. You, you seem knowledgeable about you know Islamic aspects, aspects of Islamic um, history as well as fiqh, etc. Um, how did that play out when you? when you were going through what you went through because i was just thinking about like you know subhanallah you must have had to bring in what i sometimes call emergency fiqh right in this situation like uh the only time i've ever experienced something like that is on travel you know when you're like once i was going to jerusalem i was stuck in a bus and the, the driver just wouldn't stop so we had to like use bottle of water to make wudu on the bus and pray however we could and you know use the minimum requirement for wudu and the just do the like the minimum uh, limbs that need to be washed for wudu etc I mean that's just travel but for you there must have been so many times when there were predicaments like not, not knowing what time it is yeah, especially if you're in solitary confinement, how can you tell? Like, also, water. Uh, you know, there must have been people. Sometimes they might have had to make ghusl, and they they didn't have the means for that. Uh, having a clean space to pray, uh, the qibla. You know, I know that those things end up becoming secondary if in an emergency or in in the in the state of darura, but. Even just like you said, being in the position for Salah uh, in Ramadan, knowing when to start your fast, end your fast. I mean, it's just like so many things that 
like when you're in a group, sometimes I'm on these WhatsApp groups with students of knowledge and Darul Uloom graduates and that's all they talk about, you know, <laughs> like the time, the different fiqh, little details of fiqh and you just think, subhanAllah, we get so kind of lost in all those details. But in your situation, it was literally a state of emergency fiqh, right? Yeah, I've never heard that term before, that. but I, I like the term emergency fiqh. I think in Arabic it would be good fiqh yeah, al yeah. which means, uh, I, I don't know if it's, it's, it's a legal term, but it sounds good um, because it wasn't just emergency as in, well, it was an emergency, but it was kind of a longer term emergency as it were. But all of those things you said, of course, um, if you don't know which way the qibla is, there are, of course, positions and rulings on that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wherever you are, face, uh, um, face for the sake of Allah. And in the end, the most beautiful verse is Surah Al-Baqarah. It, it mentions, لَيْسَ الْبِرْ أَن تُوَلُّوا وُجُوكُمْ قِبْلَ الْمَشْرِقِ وَالْمَغْرِبِ That's one of my favorite ayahs. Because it goes through, this verse goes through that it isn't goodness. Goodness in and of itself isn't, isn't about which direction you face. Goodness is believing Allah and the messages in the books and so forth. And all of this. And Look at this. This is and those who are patient in t times of hardship and wherever that hardship is. These are the people who are truthful. These are people who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the beauty of Allah's, uh, Allah's deen. That it, if you really analyze it, and though our, our deen is, of course, about important rituals that were taught by the Prophet sallallahu the heart and the spirit of this religion isn't about ritualism. It's about the spirit of Islam. It's about what you do, and it's about what you intend to do. And we took those rukhsa, those rukhsas that were given to us, whether it's to do with the salah, instead of completing our salahs, we shortened, I think, all of the brothers, whether they're from the various schools of thought, the Ahnaf brothers, uh, from or the Afghans and the, the Taliban guys and so forth, or whether it was the more kind of um, traditional Salafi type who who would shorten their prayers regardless of, of the distance, regardless of of the the time and so forth. Uh, there were all those different, opinion, different opinions there, and all were, what what was beautiful about it is that they all respected one another's positions. There were people, Talabat al ilm there were not uh, scholars, scholars of Guantanamo, um, who who recognized the, the rukhsa in Islam for all of these different things. Uh, we, I made tayammum, tayammum dry ablution for one year completely. I didn't have, it was a choice of the bottle of water that they give you, either drink it or you can use it for things like wudu and washing. And if you do that, then you don't have water to drink. So it was a very easy equation for me and everybody else. We just made them. And yes, all other things like ghusl and so forth was very difficult, it, very it, impossible to do in fact, um, because you drink the water or, or you, you go thirsty and you, and you come close to death. Um, there was other aspects of fiqh that people try to uh, interpret for themselves, like is it halal to hunger strike? And to what point can you hunger strike? Uh, and people would quote Umar ibn Khattab and, and who would uh, not hunger strike but keep away from food in solidarity with the people of Medina during the, 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 the famine. Um, the famine. And of course hunger was something that the Sahaba Ridwan um, knew full well. We have that, m multiple narrations of them tying rocks to their stomachs and so forth. This was out of a, a, a situation where they have little choice. Um, and here the brothers, many brothers, some did and some didn't, hunger strike on the basis of is there a good that can be done? It's a form of protest. Some agreed, some didn't, didn't agree, but both sides respected one another. I thought that this was the, the maturity of the aspects of these aspects of fiqh that brothers there, um, for the most part, uh, were able to impart and, and not apply strict, rigid rulings uh, that would only harm one another. Were there times when you lost your sense of time, like in terms of time of day? And... Yes, of course, that's another thing. I mean, I, I, in Bagram, when I was held in Bagram, and even in, in Guantanamo for, for quite some time, I didn't know whether it was day or night. I didn't know what the time things were. I didn't have a, a, a timetable. I didn't have a clock. I didn't have a watch. I didn't know any of those things. So you can only estimate. Or 
um, base it upon a, if there's a good soldier that happens to be on, on, on guard at that point, it will tell you because they're not required to tell you the time, uh, the time or the date and so forth. So we didn't know any of those things. We didn't know. I know the first Ramadan that came for me in, in, Guant in Guantanamo, uh, I didn't know it was Ramadan and I didn't know it was Eid. I was by myself and there was nobody there to, to practice it with, to, to do any of those things with. So it was all guessing. Um, I had, and so eventually, of course, things did change for a lot of the prisoners and things have changed. The Americans have instituted those things and recognized those religious aspects. But in the beginning, it was a, it was a, a great struggle. Yeah. Um, Brother Muslim, you, it seems like you had memorized some Quran bef like, and so I was just thinking like, if you, if a person hadn't memorized any Quran, they would have found it very difficult to connect, right, with with anything really, with with the word of Allah. But you, I think you did, you had memorized uh, some Quran, and so did that help you? I had memorized some. I'd say you know, the last juz and some of the smallest uh, smaller surahs I had memorized, uh, but I didn't know a great deal. I I, could, I hadn't memorized a lot. Um, in fact, the beauty for me was, the beauty was memorizing Quran in incarceration. That was the beauty of it because um, the ability to contemplate, I felt my contemplation, my tadabbur in, in, in prison was far, far greater than it is as a free person. And that's because the, the ayahs, you see them in a different way, in a different light. Of course, there's all the ayat to do the, the, within so, the story of Surah Yusuf salam, which all prisoners will talk about. Um, but I'm talking about many other of the, the verses in the Quran that make you self-reflect on so many different things, so many different aspects. Mm -hmm. um, just a simple one, though it's to do with talaq, the, the, this verse is to do with talaq, but the verse, وَمَا يَتَّقِ اللَّهِ يَجْعَلْ لَهُمْ مَخْرَجَ وَيَرْزُقُهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ وَمَا يَتَوَكَلَ اللَّهِ فَأَوْحَسْبُ So this verse in the Quran is whoever fears Allah, he will make a way out for him. Now, if I see that as a prisoner, I say, hold on, if I fear Allah, I'm getting out. That, that's, I see, as, as a literal interpretation, though this is for mm. uh, uh, women or, or men who are in a, in, in a situation of talaq. Um, and Allah then, the best part is, min la yahtasib. That is something I came to learn only after my release. So first, uh, fear Allah, Allah will show you the way out then he will provide for you from where you never expected. When I was released from Guantanamo, I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no idea which direction I'm going to go in. I was terrified actually, because I thought, who's going to want to have anything to do with a, a, a guy who's accused by the most world's most powerful country of being connected to Al-Qaeda? Who's going to want to have anything to do with him? I was terrified. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opened one door after the, after the next, after the next, after the next, which I can't, I can't even describe how many doors have been opened and what types of people I've met, which types of, where influence has, has gone to, to world leaders, to uh, people who've had experiences that make mine look insignificant, but to be heard in places um, has been part of that risk, uh, from where I never imagined. Um, so contemplating on those verses in the Quran, in that context, as a prisoner who's thinking about things, uh, is unique. I think that I wouldn't wish it upon anybody, but that part of it, that khalwa with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, that part, everybody needs to taste it somehow, somewhere, even in their house. How how did you get the Quran in the first place? Um, the Mus'haf? That's interesting because in the beginning, in the early days, um, it was actually very shocking what the American soldiers did. They, they, in some instances, they ripped the Quran, they tore it into pieces and they threw it into buckets that were, that we used to, we or they used for, for the toilet. Um, it was heartbreaking. It was destructive. It was a desecration that we almost couldn't tolerate. We'd say violate our bodies. But if you violate this book, um, you, you go beyond the pale. Um, but I and that's why they did it, right? That's why they yeah, did it because they I, I knew. Won't, I won't say it was a policy of the Americans. I won't say it's a, by mm. policy by nature, but it was allowed to happen. And yeah, yeah, uh, the fact that it was allowed to happen and the fact that it got to most, if not all of us. But my reflection upon it in in hindsight 
is a very important one I think that I'd like to share. The Quran itself was put together in a book well after the death of the Prophet ﷺ. He didn't instruct his Sahaba to put it into the book um, in, that, in that way in his lifetime. It, didn't, it wasn't put together in a book in his lifetime. And the only reason why the Sahaba put it into the book in the first place is because you know that the, the Battle of Yamama or the Hufad from Ahl Sufa and the people who memorized the Quran were getting killed in its defense. And the Sahaba feared that this book would be lost. So they put it, mm. they gathered it. Meaning, this Quran that we love so dearly, whose pages we, 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 we uh, are so connected to, was revealed to a man who went, was said to him in the very first instance, Iqra, he replied, Ma ana biqari. I do not read. He is Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, al-Nabi al-Ummi, the unlettered prophet. So his Quran was came to his heart and he passed it over to the hearts of his companions. And there were occasions in Guantanamo, I kid you not, sister, when the Americans, we know sometimes we'd come back to ourselves, we find that there are boot prints in the Quran or somebody has written profanities in the Quran or spit marks or worse, that you've come back to your cell, you found this. I don't care if they turn my cell upside down, but to find this is, is too much. Some of the brothers, they did, they did this thing that's just amazing. They took the Quran and they said, yeah, he said, listen, if you're going to use the Quran to hurt me, take it back. Can you imagine that handing back the Quran? The one thing that gives you tranquility, you hand it back and say, do not abuse this book because you want to get to me, take it back. But that didn't stop them from learning the Quran. That was my point. My point was that those who knew and had memorized taught those who hadn't. So they taught the old oh, way from word of mouth. They still became hafad of the Quran. And that was my point is that this, wow, wow. in the end, it wasn't about the book, it was the preservation of the book in the hearts of men. So, like, there was literally teaching and learning of Qur'an going on um, in that setup. Yeah, of course. Uh, not just Qur'an. There was uh, many, many different subjects and disciplines from different people. There were, uh, we say that uh, Guantanamo was the University of Yusuf, Jamia to Yusuf, and that is because it's a prison uh -huh. university. They don't give you, there's no courses, like, you know, convicted prisoners around the world who get all sorts of courses and degrees and masters and doctorates they can do in prison. You can't do anything in Guantanamo. All you can do is learn from another brother. If he's Pashto, right. if he's a Pashto speaker, a Farsi speaker, a Swahili speaker, you can learn his language from him. I've met brothers who learnt, uh, one Turkish brother I know, he, he learnt, he couldn't speak any of the languages. He couldn't speak Arabic, English, uh, Pashto, Farsi or, or one other language as well. He came out speaking all of them. He'd been there for five oh, wow. years and he'd met all these different prisoners. There are other prisoners who were who worked in oil fields who taught um, people about you know the process of oil production. There were other prisoners. Uh, I remember having discussions with brothers about Hubble's expanding universe theory. I remember talking uh, with uh, one brother talking to other brothers, giving them a class. Mansour, Mansour al he's written an article about this in the New York Times, where he says, this is a lesson I took uh, in, in, in love. How do you deal with the issue of, uh, as, an, as, as an unmarried young man, how are you prepared for uh, getting married? So a, a, a married brother gives these unmarried brothers a lesson. And again, they're talking through, they're shouting at one another through the cells and saying, this is what you do, this is how you have to be, this is the Prophet this is how you treat women uh, and responding to those uh, who, who have different views. And uh, it's a beautiful article. I suggest that you go and read it. It's, it's in, in, uh, uh, um, in, in the New York Times. Uh, and so there's all of these discussions people are having in this vast university. And of course, in the midst of all of that, people get depressed, their iman goes down, they lose their connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yet at the same time, there are others who pick you up when they themselves are down. Somehow they're falling, but th while they're falling, they pick you up. And that's the beauty of being around such people. So at some point when, I mean, I remember what the kind of anger and the feeling was like at the beginning of the war, you know, and um, especially from the American side. But at some point, and so uh, that kind of explains the way some of the soldiers were, you know, treating some of the symbols of Islam, etc. But at some point, there must have been a time when things started becoming, I wouldn't like to say normal, but calmed down a little bit, you know, in terms of 
the anger and the rhetoric and the and so was there a time when you could actually talk to soldiers in a normal kind of way and where they were actually quite open to what the things that you guys were doing and to your islam for example and yeah, yeah. um yes in fact i would say that you know, human beings are complex creatures. They're not black and white, as, as some people would have us believe. They're very complex. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I experienced that right from the beginning. From the beginning, there were soldiers. I mean, not from the very beginning, when the, when the actual serious dehumanization happened, but shortly after. Um, mm -hmm. there, were, there were Americans who came along and did things uh, that would have raised an eyebrow or in some cases, probably got them thrown out of the army entirely, uh, like offering us little things, a little chocolate here, a little snack there, a little a smile here, um, a genuine smile. I mean, and some, some of them saying sorry while they're transporting you, while you've got a hood over your head, while they're moving you along. They say, I'm only doing this because it's my job. I didn't sign up to do this. I signed up to defend my country from invaders but not to come and invade somebody else's country. People said that in my ear as I'm being dragged along. Wow. Um, so his compatriot is much harsher, but he is softer. He doesn't want me to think as an individual that he's like his compatriot, though they are brothers in arms themselves. He has to show his solidarity, but he wants to show me his humanity. So as I said, humans yeah. are, are complex creatures. Um, and it all depends on your communicability. If you are able to communicate with somebody and they see you as a human being, it's it's more unlikely for you to be abused by them than it's as, as if if you don't speak their language they'll scream at you i saw this happening that they're screaming at a prisoner who doesn't understand the language so they scream even louder thinking that that uh, <laughs> making themselves sound louder somehow he will all understand uh, and that sort of stuff happened so much and i have come across so many soldiers former soldiers that have apologized it's hard to list i don't make all of them public because I want to protect their identities. But if you allow me to share one little story, and there have been many, this was just from a few days ago. There was an American soldier. He sent me a message on Facebook Messenger. I hadn't picked it up because it went to my spam folder. But when I looked at it, he said, he said, Salam. He said, my brother. And then he went on to say that if you don't, I don't know if you remember me, but I was one of your guards in Bagram. And I was involved in uh, detention but also military operations and then he said uh, I want to apologize sincerely my dear brother for being part of that I never took any pleasure at all in the abuse of any prisoners and then he said something which really gripped my heart then he said I am a Native American my nat my, my mother my, my grandparents were not even citizens of my own country. So I know what it's like to dehumanize people. And I wasn't, I didn't want to be part of that. And then he said, I, I received blast trauma injury from, from in my brain from an attack that took place in Afghanistan. And he said, I picked up Al-Quran al karim He used those words. I picked up Al-Quran al karim and I started to read it. And it started to give me peace where I could find none. And then he ends by saying, my dear brother, once again, he uses that term, please forgive me. And it just, what do you say to somebody like this? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can bring hidayah and guidance to whoever he wishes, whenever he wishes, however he wishes. If the Prophet ﷺ used to say, Allahumma aizz al-Islam bi ahabi al-Umrain, uh, meaning may Allah give honor to Islam from one of the two Umars who at the time were enemies of Islam, Umar al-Khattab or Umar al-Hisham, a.k.a. Abu Jahl, then what are such folks? Uh, of course, we should make uh, dua for their guidance. And, and I can tell you just another, I mean, there are at least five to six that I'm in contact with, former soldiers, male and female, black, white, Hispanic, who became Muslims. I was only three, so, there, uh, for three years. That's, that's my knowledge. There are brothers, they've been there for 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 years. Their knowledge on this is far greater. And how do you explain that? You know, like if somebody was to say, how could people suddenly or, you know, over 
through that experience become softened to Islam or become, you know, attracted to Islam, what would you say is like maybe a pattern or a common thread between all of them that you can see? Uh, I think it's my view is this um, that they have seen Islam and heard about Islam from a particular direction, so they see something that's it's intrinsically bad. It's the it's the essentially it's the the story of Umar ibn Khattab's uh, uh, con coming to Islam. You oppose it because you don't know it. You haven't seen it. When you see it in your household, or you see it close to you, then you realize. Then you see something else. A sister once contacted me on Facebook. She has a hijab in a picture, and she says, brother, were you in Guantanamo? I said, yes, I was. She said, so was I. And I said, well, there were no female prisons there. She said, I wasn't a prisoner. I was one of your guards. So I thought, Allahu Akbar. She said, yes, please tell the brothers. She said, the message. She said, send a message to the brothers that it was because of their love for Islam and their connection to their faith that I went home, researched Islam, and became a Muslim. That's what the, the seed for the love of Islam was sown in my heart by watching their practice. Um, and so there was this, there was always a fascination. I think even those who detested Muslims or detested the prisoners, they, they recognized the importance of how we, uh, we prayed at fixed times, how we held on, how there were things that we wouldn't budge on, budge on religiously and even things like how the sister said she became a Muslim. She said, one of the reasons I became Muslim, when there were many, she said, when I, I turned, I was of a, a Catholic uh, origin, but when I was depressed, I turned to boys, to drugs, to alcohol, to all of these things. But I saw you prisoners turning to one another and turning to somebody far greater than all of you. And I, I was very moved by that. I saw when the men would talk to me, they'd, they'd lower their eyes so that they wouldn't stare at me in the face. And she said that was mm. so opposite to the experience I have as a female in the U.S. Army, where there is sexual abuse is rampant. Um, so it was a totally different experience for me. And and uh, so it was it wasn't just the uh, the ideological sort of intellectual dawa. In fact, far from it. It was actually watching people and seeing how they live. Everyday things, right? Everyday being a Muslim. Exactly. Exactly. Mm, I think I think there's a message in that for all of us, actually, because. I think we sometimes um, underestimate how people are viewing us and receiving us. And, you know, uh, I remember even just being contacted from by friends from school who then said, you know, we used to actually really admire the fact that you wore the hijab and that you were different or that you weren't part of that, the culture, you know, um, that we all felt we had to be part of. Or we used to admire the fact they used to pray, you know, all those kinds of things. Sometimes we feel like we're being viewed in a negative way, but actually there's something irresistible about faith, isn't there? There's something irresistible about, in people's fitra, they cannot resist uh, admiring it. My belief is this, you know, subhanAllah, one of the things, you know, my father used to tell me um, in a very proud way, but also a little bit, I don't know, I'm not sure how to describe it, but he used to say we are, descendants of the Mongols and descendants of, of the tribe of uh, Jogotai. In fact, I learned recently, I didn't even know, I've, my, my original, original family name was Muazzam or, or Beg Jogotai. But okay, so you're related to my husband yeah. then? Yeah, exactly. Um, so we have that connection and somebody took the, took the name off and so forth. And he'd oh. say often that we are the descendants of Genghis Khan and so forth. And I said, but that Genghis Khan destroyed Islam. You know, he, he, he destroyed the Muslim world and he said, yes, but his descendants all became Muslims. Within a hundred mm. years, the entirety yes. of all of that Mongol horde, the Golden Horde and the White Horde and all the Central Asian uh, pub republics uh, where they settled, they all accepted Islam. And this is, this is quite unique, I think, because essentially these are conquerors who, whose hearts have been conquered yeah, yeah. by Islam. And yeah, I know. I know there were different things that caused that, but I remember reading one of the things was this kind of it kind of has echoes of what you're saying. Was the women who were taken as prisoners, Muslim women, taken as prisoners of war, taken as slaves, basically by the Mughals, Mongols, 
and who ended up raising the next generation of children that they actually influenced especially one of the princes i've forgotten his name uh, and they said that he became a muslim because of the influence of his nanny who was a basically a a, a muslim woman slave uh, who brought him up and from the from his uh premiership onwards they were muslims apparently that that's one of the yeah, it's part of that. It's, it's fascinating. It's, it's. I mean, it, it. And we are me, my presence, and I, I guess your your husband's presence. The very fact that we are evidence of that. We are evidence of Islam entering the hearts of those people who, at one point, were opposed to it. And uh, so, seeing soldiers again, just just last week, I, I I'm not, you know. I can't describe how often, as I said, I get contacted by soldiers. Some of them, of course, not the majority of them don't become Muslims, but all of them are sympathetic to the cause of Muslims now because of Guantanamo. So only because of their experience in Guantanamo, they've recognized Islamophobia. In fact, they are, they see it much quicker than most people do. They see it around mm. the world uh, in, in, in different aspects, but it's because they were there. They were part of a system. They saw it. They witnessed us praying. They witnessed some of them. Some of them saw how their colleagues pushed their boots on brothers' heads while they were praying in in sajda. They they saw it themselves. They saw that type of abuse take place, and they were ashamed of it. And that's why I've always said that I think that there's far a lot more good in America in potential because of people recognizing those things and coming out. It's just because of what's around them. It stops them from. Uh, airing how the, th that kind of dissent, as it were. Um, but having said that, all, all of those soldiers who became Muslims, um, they did so based upon watching the prisoners and then learning about Islam afterwards and doing their own research. So what they saw triggered like an interest and an adm admiration, and then they followed that up later. Yes. Were there any Christians who tried to preach to you guys? Yes, they were. Because I know there's a lot of Christians in the army, right? American army. Yeah, it's, I mean, religion is big in America, full stop. I mean, it was it was not unusual to find an American soldier coming in, into my cell. I'm in the cell area, uh, locked up, and he's sitting outside, and he's just sitting reading his Bible. That was not uncommon. Um, that would happen. Um, I had discussions and long-term debates, discussions with American soldiers, one of whom in particular I remember to this day, he was a Southern Baptist, an evangelist, um, preacher, like he wanted to preach Christianity. Uh, and he gave me a, a Bible, which I still have to this day. And it's a Bible which has combat colors. So it's, so it's a khaki colored Bible, US military issue. And he, he to told me to take it uh, and thought that he's doing da'wah to me. And I had read the Bible so many times, as, you know, as, as a kid, uh, going to Jewish schools and Christian schools and so forth. So I knew it. Um, and I spent that time making little notes from that Bible, all about the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mentioned in Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Apostles, Corinthians, and so forth, um, and where Jesus doesn't say that he's the son of God. In fact, he says, I'm the son of man. And it says the son of God uh, is Adam, uh, David, all human beings are sons of God, and so forth. Uh, and so I started to question him this whole concept about the son of God, and that surely uh, you must believe in what Jesus says, is that it is not he, up to him to grant positions in paradise, but the one who sends him. He's, this isn't all in the Bible. So when I started to challenge him on those simple concepts that every Muslim knows and um, present them to him, he, he he changed his tone. He he didn't want to make da'wah to me anymore. But I did speak to other soldiers and said, look, please open your eyes and take a look at this. I'm not, be, I'm not much of a proselytizer. I'm not much of a, a da'wah kind of person. But now that you've got me into it, I want you to take an open look at this properly and compare it to the Qur'an and the Qur'an that you see us. You see how we memorize it. You see how even those who are not Arabs memorize it. You cannot take away the Qur'an from our hearts, even if you burnt every book, even if you ripped up every book as you did and threw it in the toilet. We'd still memorize it. You, you wouldn't lose it because we have this tradition of connecting to the original. Tell me, what language did Jesus speak? What language was the Bible originally written in? When was it translated in the King's, King James Version? How far do you have to get from the original to, to, to make it, conf, you know, to conform to what you're reading now? And they didn't want to hear those questions. Those who did, 
I think, uh, ha ha started to view, view Islam as a, hold on, this is a religion that really is authentic. And uh, those were beautiful conversations. And it, it, that raised my iman. SubhanAllah. You know, uh, this, this whole conversation about people finding Islam in different strange ways. Uh, it reminds me of um, when I was in Bahrain, I, I heard that there was an, a U.S. Army base there. And um, there's this big masjid there. I think it's called Masjid Fatih. And when we went inside, they have a dawah department. And the sister in charge of the dawah department was saying to me, do you know there are a lot of U.S. soldiers who become Muslim here? And, they, and uh, wh while I was there, they were giving tours to soldiers and their families of the mosque. So sometimes I think their families are allowed to come over or something. And it was just so weird to see these men, like, you know, wearing their army uniform, uh, going through the mosque and uh, learning about Islam. And the looks on their faces was, you know, there was like a humility. There was like a, it was almost like a reverence and an appreciation for maybe a culture and a place where they hadn't expected to be the way it was, you know, once they were actually there. And I was thinking, subhanAllah, like, although obviously as Muslims, we view it as negative that there are army bases in these different places, right? Like, we don't really know what's Allah's plan, right? We don't know what's really going on and uh, how many people are actually bring, being brought to Islam through that. I mean, look, one of the, the obvious thing from this experience for me has been um, that, and, and for, of course, others and from the example that you're giving, is that there are things that are happening that, that are not good for the Muslim world in terms of uh, the presence, the political sort of connection to it. But if you take a different aspect of it and, and see, even from this, right, even for, because a Muslim is supposed to look for, where is the khair in this? Surely there must be some good in this. And yeah. Yeah. once you start to look at it in that way, um, th then your outlook will be different. And there was a time I would have thought that, yes, absolutely, you know, complete presence of, of them, there, it's, it's totally wrong. And uh, there can be no good of it, but you're cor you're correct. There is even if the khair is 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 invisible to you, it's going to be there. Yeah, absolutely. And as Muslims, we have to think like that because I think um, otherwise we end up giving too much power to the negative forces. Do you know what I mean? Like mm. the fact that we know that Allah is in control should make us look for those little glimmers of light, right? Absolutely, no, absolutely, um, yes, yeah. Uh, Brother Mazam, uh, I just want to ask you about Ramadan in Guantanamo, okay? And, you know, what was that like? That must have been, like, is there a build-up to Ramadan in Gran Guantanamo? Um, or does it just suddenly appear and somebody reminds you and... You start to make the preparations in Rajab and, Sha you know, uh, Shaban and... <laughs> You, they don't give you, special, know, you don't even know what the treatment? Gregorian you don't even know what the Gregorian months are, let alone the Hijri months. You, you just don't know. Um, and of course, I won't say that's the situation now. It's changed. It has changed dramatically. Um, but I can only give my experience. And my experience mm. is, this, is that you just didn't know. You didn't know the months or the times. Or and when eventually we did find out it was Ramadan in the first Ramadan in Bagram, where I was for about one year. Um, we found out, I think, three days later that Ramadan had begun. And that was only because some new prisoners had come in and they told us it's Ramadan. And oh. then we didn't have food. We weren't allowed to keep food in our cell area. You have to hand, you, so your, your, your meal time, as it was, a small little pack, a plastic pack of, it's known as MRE, meal ready to eat, um, which is military ration, but they, they take all the condiment, condiments, um, heaters, uh, spoons, they just give you this pack and you have to tear this pack open with your teeth and, and kind of gulp down the contents because there's no other way to eat it. Uh, and it's just a cold meal. And that was what they would give us. And we have to hand it back within 15 minutes, if it's oh. eaten or, or not. So there's nothing we keep in ourselves. So if they don't give us food at the time for sahur, because nobody, no, that's not, that's not food time, it's not breakfast time as far as they're concerned. So we've got no food for sahur. And we've got no food for iftar because again it has to conform to their times not our times right. so we would get uh, when we did eventually start to fast we got uh food for iftar 
four or five hours after, depending. And sometimes they would do it to be vindictive um, after t- time for iftar. So we would open our fast with water and wait until we get food. Um, Salat al-Tarawih didn't happen. Salat bil jamaa didn't happen. We weren't allowed to do any of those things. Even Salah with reading your reading loud or reading the Quran out loud was a punishable crime. When I mean by punishable, you would be taken to the to the front of the cage and suspended with your hands tied to the top of the cage in a hood place of your head and left there for several hours. That's the, the infraction, the punishment for the infraction of opening your mouth. You're not allowed to. So that was the situation for an entire year. And that's in the same place where we had to make wudu, I mean, sorry, tayammam for a year. Um, but again, look for the khair. What the khair was this? It's in, I think in Ramadan, I believe, that I memorized the whole of Surah Al-Baqarah uh, in Bagram. And for me, that was a huge achievement because up until this time, I'd only memorized short surahs from surah, uh, from the from Juz Amma. Uh, so for me, that was like this. I can't tell you how much joy I had. Uh, from from that day when I completed the memorization. Um, was there any chance for Taraweeh or was that just like... Um, we couldn't. We, we were not allowed to. We were not allowed. The, the, the rule was for us that we couldn't call the Avan. In Bagram this was. We couldn't call the Avan. We couldn't stand in prayer together. We couldn't pray together. We couldn't even recite the Quran loud. We'd get literally tortured if we did um, and unfortunately the person who told them to not allow us this was an Egyptian American who said that these guys talk to one another in, in their prayers the call to prayers is is a, is a message to one another the Quran recitation loud is a message to one another and therefore they're not actually praying so it was on a, it was sadly a, a, an Egyptian American who told them um, to were, were there Muslim soldiers yes yes there were we were Muslim soldiers, Muslim interrogators, um, unfortunately. What was that yes. like? like, like um, is there any connection with them? Not really, no. no. Wow. Um, and uh, there were some exceptions, one or two exceptions. There was Captain James Yee, who is known as Yusuf Yee in Guantanamo, who was an exception because when he came, he came as a Muslim chaplain and he started to bring big books of fiqh, of aqidah, of seerah and so forth for the library, which were prior to that were not allowed um, but again, another shocking thing, within four months of him being there, he's a U.S. Army captain in the U.S. Army. He was arrested and placed in a military brig in Florida where he was held for four months uh, because of his sympathy towards the soldiers. Be- be- sorry, because of sympathy towards the prisoners. Um, he left the army and he spoke out against Guantanamo. He's toured over here and, and met with me. Um, but unfortunately, that was the, the, the how people were treated at the time. Um, but yes, Muslim soldiers were few and far between for us. And when we did see them, it, it felt like the ultimate betrayal. Um, mm. Yeah. When I was in Egypt, I met a lot of Muslim ex-soldiers who had basically abandoned the army and fled to Egypt and because they had been called on to go to the XYZ Muslim country. And that's when they'd realized that they didn't want to be part of this. So... SubhanAllah, so, yeah. yeah. Um, and, Brother Muslim, it, are there any verses of Qur'an or any particular surahs that really, you've already mentioned some of them, but that you could reflect on that just really meant a lot during that time, um, or that you noticed that, you know, sometimes there are verses that we read a lot, but then we don't really notice them, like the the power in them until a certain situation hits us? Um, of course, there, there are many, um, many verses in the Quran that, that, uh, that at the time and even, even then um, were, were more important to me uh, than they are now. Um, from the beginning of Surah Mumtahina, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, wa ma wa ma alantum. I know that which you have, are hiding and that which you have done openly. And this was in reference to, um, I felt, that the, the CIA interrogating me and saying, come and work with us. And saying, this is in Bagram, come work with us and, and you'll be free and 
you all you have to do is just tell on X, Y, Z and become a spy. And that really hit hard. It was, I went back and, and, and I looked at those verses and I thought, Allahu Akbar. Look, look this, I feel this is Allah is talking to me. And, uh, um, and all the different verses of, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, talks about testing you. Um, um, Do you think that you will enter Jannah and you will not be tested like those who, who were tested before you? That they were tested with trials and afflictions until the earth underneath their, shook, underneath their feet shook. Until the Prophet himself said, and those who believed said, When will the help of Allah come? And the beautiful response, Allah inna Nasrullah qareeb. And I remember there's this amazing brother, I love him for the sake of Allah. His name is Faiz al Kandari. He's a Kuwaiti brother who I speak to him often, and he has a huge following. He's one of the scholars of Guantanamo, even now. Um, he came to me in, in Kandahar prison, and he was shackled. They were moving along and coming right past the, the soldiers and he happened to stop in front of each prisoner's cell as they allowed him before they dragged him off for a couple of seconds. And he would say, Al-Faraju Qareeb wa Nasrullahi Qareeb. SubhanAllah. And I remember those words because that's all I remember from him. I never saw him again. And I was released in three years. After three years, I was released. He was released after 14 years. After 14 years, he was released. And he's one of the most amazing individuals I've ever come across, especially now I speak to him quite regularly. And uh, if you, you can, you can for only the Arabic speakers, um, just listen to his, his, his wisdom and knowledge and understanding of what he's gone through. Uh, and um, really, I, I advise, if, if, you've, if you've ever come across this video, this, this series of videos from the brother called uh, Fahad al-Kandari, who is... Um, uh, it is a program called Wabil Quran that with the Quran I was guided. Um, he's a relative of his. He's a close relative of his, and uh, it's just. I mean, the, these joys you will never find them. These gems, rather, you will never find them, unless Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wishes you to taste it somewhere. Subhanallah. Well, and it never occurred to me that there might be scholars as well in a place like that. Yeah, there were a few. As I said, there were a few known as the scholars of Guantanamo. Perhaps out in the world here, they won't be, you know, the rank of, of great ulama and so forth. But they're scholars mm -hmm. in their own rights, and especially the scholars of of, of experience, um, of 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 that entire lived experience of emergency fiqh, as you mentioned, um, that they had to that they had to uh, construct and and deconstruct and uh, impart to brothers who were seeking who had to have answers. Brother Muslim, uh, if you have any like parting advice for us uh, in terms of like Ramadan in lockdown, if there's anything, that, any reflections that you've had. Actually, before that, could you describe to us what it was like the first Ramadan back? You know, or the first Salah after you experience yeah. freedom for the first time? I wrote an article called Ramadan in Guantanamo, it's called, uh, and it begins with, um, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and this is like a, a statement from uh, Charles Dickens' book, in, uh, yes. A Tale of Two Cities, and it is really that, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times, it's good, it's al-usr mal yusr, hardship with ease, it's all of those things, um, so there's, it's it's not all good, it's not all bad, I'm not going to sing praises of everything there, and I'm not going to um, put down everything there. In the same way, when I came back to, to, to home, I, of course, loved being with my family and doing iftar and salah bin jama'ah and uh, tarawih and all of those things. I loved it, but I missed, I missed being in solitary. I missed khalwa with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I missed being able to memorize the Quran in the way that I could. And that for me was the best environment. I I'd struggle to do it at home in a busy, busy environment that I'm, I, I didn't struggle in prison. Um, I missed my brothers shouting from across the cells, Hani and Marian at the time of uh, opening a fast, you know, Bilafia, you know, I, I missed it. I missed brothers saying things to me that I can't even see their face, but I know he cares for me. 
I can't see his face. I just hear his voice. Uh, and I missed it greatly because it wasn't here. Uh, there were other things here. There were other beautiful things here, but that wasn't here. Um, and sometimes that part of it, that part of the only thing I would say in the time of lockdown now today where people are struggling and thinking, should I be able to go to the masjid and I miss the jama'ah? And even when we do go to the masjid, you can't stand together and so forth. And I know there's something I've, you mentioned it and I, I'm deeply uh, aware of it. The sisters can't go at all. There's hardly any accommodation for sisters, their let alone brothers, in most of the masjid now because of, of the, the situation. Um, I just think of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi when he said, he said, don't, uh, don't make your homes into graveyards. If your home wasn't a masjid to begin with, then it should have become one in lockdown. If, you're, if you weren't an imam to begin with in your, in your home, you should have become one in lockdown. If you weren't doing all of those things that you should have been doing and had only passed over the masjid, this, this is the place only this happens in the masjid, then you made a big, big mistake. And Allah gave you an opportunity to make that center, your home, the center of that learning your home is your masjid. It doesn't, I don't mean don't go to the masjid. I mean, your home is your masjid. It should all of those things that you used to pass off to the masjid or to the Islamic school or to the madrasa or to the, all of those things you're forced now to do at home, teaching your kids the Quran. If you weren't doing that at home and we're only passing it over to the masjid, you were mistaken, deeply mistaken. Um, so I pray that inshallah, if th this is the benefit that we can still take out of from this lockdown period. Um, and I, for one, actually, I'm, thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we're able to have um, Ramadan in lockdown. I'm thankful, deeply thankful. Um, what makes you say that? Um, because when we go to the masajid, often, uh, especially Salat al-Tarawih and so forth, there's such a rush. You have to get there, you've just eaten, you rush there. Um, you're almost sometimes trampling over people to get to the masjid. The, the, the spirituality, mm. the spiritual aspect, it seems devoid to me with with mm. all of those things a certain that, amount of rushing around right that happens yeah in there's that and then there's um then there's also the the, the well you know it's you know we all know salat al is, is is a sunnah prayer you don't have to go there mm. and yet there's this rush to get there and at least you could make it rather than do your faraid in the masjid but do your sunnah at home and let your family benefit from it. And it seems like the other way around. So I'm, I'm kind of happy that you got the opportunity um, to be able to do that at home. And for people to experience being an imam and the home, to experience it. Uh, so I'm, as I said, I'm, I'm thankful for it. And of course, the most important thing, as I said, praying in Jama'ah is important. There's no doubt. But people miss and miss out on khalwa with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is something that you cannot replace. I mean, uh, for me as a former prisoner, you can't replace it in, in, in this place. Um, and lock lockdown's kind of been a little bit of a taste of it. Yeah, Jazakallah khairan. That's true. I mean, actually, people might think it's quite strange to hear someone like you say that you missed such and such experience and missed such and such experience. But I was thinking, like as human beings, we're always looking forward, aren't we? We're always thinking, I can't wait till lockdown's over. I can't wait till this is over or that is over. And yet we do have the opportunity to, in some ways, make the most of the, the current, the, the little ben benefits that there are in the kind of current situation, such that later on, when things do go back to normal, we would look back and miss those things as well. So, yeah. Jazakallah khairan, uh, Brother Muazzam, I really appreciate your time and your wisdom and um, you've given us so many things, interesting things to think about and, and to value about the things that I think we sometimes take for granted. Um, so uh, please convey our salams to your family and uh, Jazakallah khairan. Barakallah fikum and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from uh, you and all your work and uh, uh, I, I pray that also that we do take all the great benefits of being in this situation and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raises uh, your rank in this dunya and akhirah. Ameen. And I'm going to tell my husband that you are a jaghtai. So <laughs> he'll be happy about that, inshallah. Um,
brothers and sisters, Jazakumullah Khairan for joining us. Uh, I'm sure you benefited from that as much as I did. Uh, wow, subhanAllah. So please do share that this episode with others, uh, people who maybe are thinking about Ramadan. Everyone's kind of preparing now uh, and, and looking forward to it. So do share it. Do uh, tell somebody new about this uh, podcast. Alhamdulillah, the Umfid podcast is one of the top podcasts in many countries, uh, in the West especially. Uh, but, you know, we want to reach even more people. So, and we rely on you to help us do that. Jazakumullah uh, khairan. And with that, I will bid you farewell. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.